It is indeed my pleasure to be back with you this morning. Uh, I do know that hymn tune. That is one that we do know uh, in the United States. But uh, I almost embarrassed myself once again by singing the Amen at the end. Uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, in fact, we sing the Amen at some songs that were clearly designed not to have an Amen song at the end of them anyway. So uh, that was one thing I had to get used to when I went to Phoenix Reform for the first time back in 1989 uh, and have been there uh, ever since. Uh, we've already had the reading in Philippians chapter 2. If you'll turn with me there, you may recall those of you who were with us yesterday that we very briefly touched upon uh, this text, but it was so brief uh, that I could only uh, mention the first few words and uh, I felt like we were rushing through it. So uh, over the years, as I have observed my fellow elder, uh, Don Fry, preaching at the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church, I've become more and more convinced that uh, I'm not a very good preacher uh, in the sense that he crafts sermons. He works so hard at that task. And uh, I generally am more of a teacher. And uh, it is, it is uh, far easier for me to open the text and to expound as far as what the text is saying and what its background is. So if you're looking for three points in a poem, I'm afraid I left all of those someplace else. There are far more than three points to be had in this particular text. Many scholars believe that the text we're looking at actually gives us a brief opportunity to look into the hymn book of the early church. Uh, you may note in uh, certain, certain printings of the Bible that this is laid out in poetic form. And the reality is that uh, if this is from the hymn book of the early church, uh, they had quite a hymn book. Uh, it was not like many that uh, we have in the world today. Uh, this is focused very much upon what God has done. And if this is indeed something that Paul himself received, in other words, something that was the common possession of all of the, the believers, uh, then what he's doing here is he is giving a sermon illustration from something that all the believers would have held in common, something they all would have understood. And I hope you realize this tremendous text, verses 5 through 11, is a sermon illustration. It is coming to the people as, an, as a fulfillment of the commands of verses 1 through 4. And verses 1 through 4 give us the command to the people of God that as we live together in the congregation, that we are to do so in such a way as to live peaceably with one another. And Paul gives to us the real recipe, shall we say, for how you can have a church where we live in peace with one another. That's not natural for us. The natural way for us to live together is because we are sinners we rub each other the wrong way. Uh, we look out for our rights. We look out for what's important to us. And as a result, there is division and there is strife and there is difficulty. But what Paul is telling us is the key to peaceful Christian community and harmony in the body is to be found in avoiding self-promotion and having the, the attitude of a servant. Humility of mind is the term that is used. And he describes it. It has well been said, I don't know who said it. If someone does know who said it, you might inform me of it sometime. But the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That means there are, there are not those who are higher than others in the sense of being more Christian than others, more loved of God than others the kind of clericalism that you have in, in many religious systems where you have people that are of a, a higher spiritual nature than others. There's just no basis for that in Scripture. Paul makes it very clear, bond or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. The, the means by which we've been redeemed is the same. No one can claim a higher status in that sense. And so what would humility look like in that kind of a context? Well, Today is a day in which people talk much about the rights that we are supposed to have. Uh, you can't, uh, I haven't actually seen any television for a few days. Uh, 
uh, as far as actually sitting down and watching it, but um, uh, when I left London, uh, is, is Egypt still in turmoil? I assume that it is. Um, when things like that happen, you hear much about human rights. And here in the West, uh, there is much discussion of rights all the time, and much of that is appropriate. Some of it becomes a little excessive, but there's much focus upon rights. Well, certainly, since we are all one in Christ, we have certain rights, and we have equality before God. But humility of mind is having these rights and laying them aside in the service of others. Having certain rights and laying them aside in the service of others. And so if that were to be the attitude of everyone in the congregation, what kind of peace and harmony would exist within the congregation? I, before I went to the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church, was a member of a very very large Baptist church. And some of you are not going to believe me when I tell you. Uh, but at one point, that church had over 20,000 members in one place. Now, we could never find more than about 7,000 of them at any one time. But there were 20,000 names on the roll. Now, in that particular denomination, the Baptist church, uh, to get off the roll, you had to personally present your own death certificate in triplicate. Um, and that's why it would keep growing. Uh, very quickly uh, as to the size of the, of the membership. But it was a large church. It was a very, very uh, large church. And I ran the sound uh, for a certain period of time, which was a thankless job. If you ever have a sound man someday, and right now it's, uh, I think it's Mark is the sound man. You, you pressed a button as you left. So that's, uh, uh, that's being the sound man. Uh, you turn the microphone on. And, uh, but that can become much more complicated. This church had a 250 voice choir and a full orchestra. So you'd get there hours early, and you really worked hard. And uh, when you did everything perfectly, no one said a word to you. When you did anything wrong, they all knew where to look. And, really, and there's, there'd be you know, 4,500 people in there at one time. And uh, we sound men, there were a couple of us, because there were no, no, uh, multiple services. We, we wanted to have t-shirts made up for certain of the singers. And the t-shirt would say, more me. Because they'd always be singing, I need to hear more of me. And we're up in the sound booth going, we need to hear less of you. We wouldn't say that to them, but um, they always wanted to hear. And we noticed that, that much of the strife in the church originated with the people who you could tell were very, very proud of themselves. And they wanted everyone else to see them. And they wanted to be known by everyone in this very large, small city on a, on a Sunday morning. There was very little of this having certain rights and laying them aside in the service of others. And much of the difficulties in that church came from out of that realm of individuals. Paul's told us how we can have peace in the church. It is humility of mind. It is having rights and laying them aside in the service of others. And so this entire Christological passage, this passage about Christ that gives us so much information about his relationship with the Father. And literally for a moment the very veil of eternity is parted here so we can, we can see what was going on even in, in the thinking of the Son of God before the incarnation. What an amazing thing that God would even, would even feel it appropriate to give us such revelation. But we dare not forget that it is given to us as an illustration, as a sermon illustration, as an example of what real humility is. And that's going to become important at one point as we interpret the text because I think we can assume that when Paul gives us a sermon illustration that it's going to actually support the point of his sermon. So much of the interpretation of this text ignores the fact that this is Paul saying you in the church Act in humility of mind toward one another. Serve other people. And here's your example. Have this attitude, this mindset amongst yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So here's, he's saying, humility of mind, and here's the best example you'll ever have, Christ Jesus. And so the command of verse 5, the, the word you is plural. Have this attitude, this way of thinking amongst yourselves. This needs to be in all of the church. When it's only in a part of the church, it can cause a problem. 
but as long as it's in some part of the church, those folks will put up with great patience uh, with those who have not yet quite caught on to these things and will pray that someday they will. So there is an attitude that we are to have amongst ourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's how it illustrated itself. And this is where the poetic section begins in verse 6. Now, what is said here takes us back before, as I, I rather lengthily illustrated yesterday and will not repeat this morning, takes us back to the time before the Incarnation and tells us something about who Christ was. And on that basis, we can understand what his rights were, what his privileges were, and what he did with them out of service to, well, to the glory of God and out of love for his own people. And the first thing we are told is that, and I'm, I'm giving you a very direct translation, I'm, I have only in front of me the Greek right now. We are told that he was existing in the form of God. I mentioned to you yesterday, this is the morphe. The very form of God. Now there are people who say, oh well, you see God is spiritual and so he was a spirit. That's all it means. But notice down in verse 7, we have a similar phrase, the form of a servant. And the same Greek word is used in both places. Now, if Jesus was truly a servant, then he was truly what? God. If he truly became a servant when he made himself of no reputation, in verse 7, then I believe that what Paul is saying is, who eternally existing in the very form of God, the participle that is used here is a timeless word. It doesn't say he began existing in the form of God. He had always been existing in the very form of God. What does that, when you think about Christ existing in the form of God, does it take you back to what we were talking about in Isaiah 6? Remember yesterday we talked about how in John 12, John tells us that the one that Isaiah saw sitting upon the throne was in fact Jesus. The second person of the Trinity, the very eternal Son of God. And think of the glory that was his and the constant worship that he received. The holiness that was his. I think that gives you some insight. When you consider the cross, when you consider Jesus' struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, that wasn't fear of physical death. There have been many a man who's, who has faced physical death with great bravery. I, I am a, we live in a day where, uh, I'm sure it's the same over here, it's certainly the same in, in the United States, you can't offend anyone anymore, except Christians. It's okay to offend Christians. Our government will spend millions to sponsor art exhibits that, that offend Christians, but you, you can't say anything about Islam, for example. I am always offended when I, my Muslim friends and I use that term in the, in the cultural sense, uh, will actually make the argument that the Jesus presented in the Gospels was cowardly. That's what they say. Because he did not want to go to the cross. And they say many men have died. Uh, that's why they don't believe that Jesus actually died on the cross. But you see, I say to them, you don't understand what it is that Jesus is praying about because you don't understand that he became sin for us. It was not the physical death. It was this one who has been called holy, holy, holy for eternity, becoming sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is that great exchange that is in, in view in Jesus' prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had eternally existed in the form of God, but he did not consider the equality he had with God something to be held on to at all costs. To be held on to at all costs. Now, see, here is where there is some level of controversy. Because there are people who say, no, no, no. What's actually being said here is he didn't have equality with God and he did not consider reaching out and grasping for an equality he did not possess. 
Now, simply on the basis of the grammar, you could argue either direction. And by the way, there is an orthodox way to hold that view, but you have to be careful how you define it. I have friends who are orthodox, they believe in the Trinity and the deity of Christ, and what they think is being said here is that this equality with God is not equality in regards to participation in the divine nature, that's a given. But that it is remaining in that state of undifferentiated worship in the heavenly realms. Instead, he emptied himself. He humbled himself. He took a different role than that of the Father. And they think this is important, especially in regards to uh, the controversy over egalitarianism and complementarianism. And, and these would be men who are, who are complementarians. They, they believe that there is, there is a, a role for man and a role for women, and they believe this supports them in that. So there are those who take that position. I understand that. I, I disagree with them, because I believe what is being said, once again, this is a sermon illustration. Many years ago, I went and visited a Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that what they're called over there? They call mm -hmm. them Kingdom Halls? Okay. Uh, do you have any nearby? Oh, we do. Okay. And so I sat through the, uh, I think, I believe it was a Thursday night um, theocratic ministry school, as I recall. That's where they actually uh, prepare to talk with us, and they do studies on how to do things at the door, and so on and so forth. And Afterwards, I just basically stood in the back and looked lost, and that was a very good technique because very quickly I had all sorts of folks around me who wanted to talk. And I entered into a lengthy conversation with one of the witnesses there on the subject of Philippians chapter 2. And it went so well in that context that uh, a few months later I was meeting with some pioneer ministers who are Jehovah's Witnesses who go door to door at least 30 hours a week. So, obviously, these are dedicated folks. And I was meeting in someone's home. And we opened up the Bible, and I like to go through biblical passages with them because they won't take literature from me. Almost, well, I've had one or two, but the vast majority will not take literature from me. So I want them to take something with them. So I figure if I've explained a passage of Scripture to them, they're going to take their Bible. I've never had a Jehovah's Witness leave his Bible behind. And so we went to this text. And they gave us the standard, well, what, what's actually going on here, and oh, their translation here is horrible. It literally says, he gave no consideration to a seizure, namely to be equal with God. Okay, uh, if, if that's how you want to do it. But uh, uh, reading the New World Translation is like chewing aluminum foil. It's very, very enjoyable. And uh, so they gave the standard interpretation. Well, you see, Jesus is the greatest creation of God. And he did not try to become equal with God, but instead you have, you don't really have an incarnation in their theology. Michael ceases to exist, Jesus comes into existence, Jesus ceases to exist, and Michael is recreated, and that's who's in heaven today. Uh, it doesn't exactly fit the biblical text, but anyway. And so I said, well, that's very interesting. Let me explain to you what I believe it says, that, that Jesus had eternally existed in the very form of God, that he was equal with God, but did not consider that equality something to be grasped. But he voluntarily made himself of no reputation, and he did so by taking the form of a servant and by being made in the likeness of men. Well, how do we decide this? Remember what I said. This is a sermon illustration. And how do we define humility of mind. How do we, in those first four verses, don't look just to your own things, but look to the things of others. Having certain rights and laying them aside in service of others. Now, which interpretation of verses 6 and 7 is consistent with Paul's point? Would it be an act of humility for Michael the archangel to not try to become equal with God. Would we say, oh, look at Michael the Archangel. He's so humble. He doesn't try to usurp God's place. Is that humility? Of course not. 
Because for him to usurp God's place would be the utmost of blasphemy. The utmost of arrogance. And so how could it be that if the Jehovah's Witnesses or many liberals today, and I wasn't referring to those folks about the orthodox understanding of this, but would it, when, when they say that, that Jesus was not equal with God the Father, and he didn't try to claim, how is that humility? It's not humility. We've already said having certain rights and laying them aside in the service of others. So the only way this could be an illustration of Paul's point is if what is being said is he eternally exists in the form of God and he did not consider that equality he had with God something to be held on to at all. I'm holding on to this. No one's, no one's going to take this away from me. It's a little bit like Gollum, remember? You know, in the, in the Lord of the Rings, uh, precious, uh, you know, got to have it. That's not his attitude. That's the attitude of a lot of folks in the church about their little moment of fame. Got to have it. Don't take it away from me. Don't put me in a position of servant. But that's not what Jesus does. And when I explained that, and I used some illustrations, I used some sporting illustrations, unfortunately, those wouldn't work overly well over here. Uh, I don't happen to know who the big names in hurling or rugby are, so I would be a little bit out of my league. But uh, uh, maybe some of you had heard of Michael Jordan in the United States, a great basketball player uh, back in the 1980s and 90s. And that was the illustration I used. I said, would, would it be humility for the water boy of the Chicago Bulls to try to rush out on the court in the last three seconds of the game and take the ball out of Michael Jordan's hands and make that last final shot. No, you want Michael Jordan taking the last final shot. Uh, ask everyone who lost to him uh, in those last few seconds. You want him shooting it. And they saw it. Those two pioneer ministers saw exactly what I was saying. And I'll never forget, the one of them had the Bible open. And when I made that application... It was like the Bible had become a snake in their lap. And they were like, you could just physically see the shock on their face when they realized, that's what it's saying. That makes sense. Now, like I said, they did take the Bible with them. And you can hope and pray that, you know, the Lord and his providence would bring them by this door and that door and, and, and bring things in their life that would, would eventually cause them to Come to know the truth, but try, try to start the process anyways. They saw it. They understood it. And we need to understand, this is a sermon illustration, and the only way to understand this is that this emptying, this thing that he does himself, he made himself of no reputation. Liberal theologians have tried to say that this emptying is far more than the text will allow. Paul never uses this term in a literal sense. For example, he says, I hope that my, my work, my labor amongst you would not become empty. Well, what does that mean? It obviously doesn't, it's not a physical thing. It's not like it's, but, but to become without reputation, without result. But it's interesting that Jesus does this, the Son does this, by doing something positively. By taking on the morphe of a doulos, a servant. Now, we like the term servant better than probably the stronger word, but this was the very same word for slave. And you've got to hear how that struck the ear. Taking the form, the one who has existed eternally in the form of God takes the form of a slave. And that's not a, in the society that day, that's not a positive word. That's a word of debasement. That's a word of servitude. But he took, and this is something he did, he took the form of a servant and he was made in the likeness of men. He truly entered into our experience. That's John's point in John 1.14. The word became flesh. He didn't just appear to be a man. He wasn't a phantom. He took on human flesh. Otherwise, the atonement would be a sham. It would be uh, it would be pretend. But he took on human flesh. 
And having taken on human flesh, being found in appearance as a man. There at the beginning of verse 8, you have that same verb that had been used in the first four verses. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Further illustration that even though he had engaged in this, this making himself of no reputation, even as a servant, he truly was a servant. He acted as a servant. He humbled himself, how? By becoming obedient, and there's, here's a literal translation, becoming obedient unto death, even the cross death. Now you see, for us, especially in our societies, in, uh, both here in Ireland and the United States, cross is all around us. It's not as common as it used to be, but certainly in architecture and on churches you see crosses all around the land. And in the United States, you go to the south, for example, and uh, you go to the southern part of the United States, and uh, in, in some parts of the United States, you've got uh, three gas stations and a bank on each corner. In the south of the United States, you've got three churches and a gas station on each corner. Uh, that's, that's how it is. There's so many churches dotting the land. Uh, not all of them for the, good, the best reason, by the way. I'll, I'll never forget, I was driving with a, a friend of mine in Georgia, and we were going to see a, a Civil War site, or as he would say, a, the War of Northern Aggression site. And uh, uh, there's a little background of that. The Southerners still view it that way. But we're driving along, and I see the, the First Baptist Church. We go around a corner, and there's the Second Baptist Church. You go around the corner, and now it's getting a little weird because there's the third Baptist church. And you go over the hill, and there's the fourth Baptist church. When we got to the seventh Baptist church, I had to ask the question, what's going on here? And he says, well, Baptists know how to split churches. They really do. And they, I saw the seventh Baptist church. How would you like to go? I go to the seventh Baptist church. Well, I go to the sixth Baptist church, you heretic. <laughs> it's just, just amazing. I mean, there are that many churches down there. It's just... It's just and they all have a, have a cross up on the steeple. It's just, everybody sees it, and you know, you see movie stars and stuff, and they've got crosses around their necks, and, and they have absolutely no earthly idea what it's about. But when it says the death of the cross, you need to realize there were people who wrote in this day, cultured people, who would not even use that word because it was so harsh. It was so repulsive. The, the death by crucifixion. A Roman citizen, no matter what they had done, they could try to kill Caesar. And while they'd be executed, they couldn't be crucified. As long as you're a Roman citizen. Couldn't do it. Because it was reserved for the worst of the worst. I mean, man's ability to come up with ways of killing other men seems to know no end. But when they came up with crucifixion, they found the most painful, horrible way to execute someone that they had ever come up with. And in all of history, I only know of one documented instance where someone who was crucified and given the death blow actually survived when someone tried to save them. Josephus tells us that he was coming back one time and he found three of his friends had been crucified by the Romans. He had connections with the governor. He went to the governor, pled for their lives. They were taken down from the cross, but still two of the three died. Only one survived. And actually they had not been given the death blow. I don't know of any who had been given the death blow who ever survived, even when someone tried to save them. Because the only thing more violent than putting someone on a cross, think about it, would be taking someone off of a cross. It's a horrible way to, to die. And so, it's always amazed me. I almost, I almost chose to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning because there's, it's that, that text that talks about the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. And we don't get that so much because the cross isn't, the, the cross is seen as a positive thing in much of our society. It's not seen in the original context in which it was originally spoken. But the idea that the Apostle Paul tried to create a new religion around a crucified Messiah 
is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard of. How in the world would you start a religion, the days of, of Athens and Rome, around a crucified Messiah? As Paul himself admits in 1 Corinthians, this is foolishness to the world. This is absolute foolishness to the world to proclaim a crucified Messiah. And yet that's what he did. And here we are half a world away. Uh, 2,000 years later, repeating his words. If that's not supernatural, I don't know what is. So when he says, even the death of the cross, he's, he's already said, he could have just said, became obedient at the point of death and left it there. He didn't. Even the cross death. In other words, there is a level of obedience here that sometimes we miss. And so what does Jesus do? Verse, between verses 8 and 9, there's sort of a, a shift. In verses 6 through 8, we have seen that the Son of God does not consider the equality he had with the Father something to be held on to at all costs. He has emptied himself. He's made himself of no reputation. He's taken on the form of a servant. And then he has been made in the likeness of men. And then he has humbled himself. And he's become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now that was the, that was the end point of his obedience. But his obedience was perfect. His obedience was throughout his entire life. And aren't you thankful for that? Do you, do you thank God for Christ's purity? See, for most Christians, when you, when you talk about the purity of Christ, well, yeah, if, if he hadn't been pure, then he couldn't have died as a sacrifice for my sins. But if that's all you think about, you're missing something. Because, see, if, if I'm just simply brought back to a moral neutral point, if the death of Christ just brings me back to where Adam was, I'm lost. I'm in trouble. I need his righteousness. And the fact that he lived a perfect life up to maturity, man, it means a lot to me. It should mean a lot to you. Not only as, as our example, but the fact that he became obedient and that obedience becomes the very constituent part of my standing before God. A beautiful truth. Some of you might not know, but you should know. Now, I'm assuming that, and I, I should have asked this question earlier, but the 1689 London Confession? Okay. Uh, there's a difference in our 1689 and the Westminster Confession on the issue of justification at just this point. There were many at the Westminster uh, Conference, there were many of the Westminster Divines that wanted to, including like... As, as John Owen would defend it, wanted to say, to speak of, the active and passive obedience of Christ. They wanted to talk about his fulfillment of God's law. But there were others who said no, and they, they couldn't get enough of a quorum, shall we say, to have it inserted. And so when you compare our confession with the Westminster, at the point of this discussion, you'll see in the Baptist Confession a discussion of the active and passive obedience of Christ that is not in the Westminster Confession. Um, and it's had interesting impacts uh, even to our day at that, at that particular point. And so you have the positive acts of Christ and then the result. Because is it not the theme of Scripture over and over again? He who humbles himself, what will God do? Exalt. He will exalt him. Therefore also God has highly exalted him and given to him the name. There's a definite article in the Greek there. He has given to him the name which is above every name. It is the superlative name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and upon earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that kurios Jesus Christos. The first word is kurios. Lord. Remember. Many Christians. In those early years. Those first. 280 years of church history or so. Up until 313. When, when imperial persecution of Christians ended. Many died because. 
they would not say what Rome told them to say. Sometime toward the end of the first century, the Caesars began to demand that if you wanted to do business, if you wanted to hold positions, eventually everyone in the, in the empire was to take a, a pinch of incense and burn it upon an altar and say, Kaiser Kurias. Kaiser Kurias, Caesar is Lord. Now they didn't mind if you went Kaiser Kurias and then turned around and marched into whatever temple over here and said Adonis Kurias or Dionysus Kurias or Apollos Kurias. They didn't care. As long as you said Kaiser Kurias, Caesar's Lord. You could join with the worship of the Caesars, anything else you wanted. No problem. Sounds a little bit like our society, doesn't it? As long as you will bow to the attitudes of our society, bow to the demand that you can't believe God's the creator of all things, bow to our secularism, then you can go be religious on your own time. Just don't let it impact how you live your life in our society. That's the, the attitude we have today. But you see, the Christians and the Jews could not say Kaiser Kurios. Now the Jews, for a while, were given a, a pass, basically. But it didn't take long for the Romans to figure out these Christians are a different group. Because it wasn't just that they couldn't positively say Kaiser Kurios. But the reason they couldn't say it is because they had a positive affirmation that took its place, that precluded them, forbade them, from saying Caesar is Lord because they said Jesus Kurios, Jesus is Lord. It reminds me of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say Jesus Kurios except by the Holy Spirit. Now when we think about it, well, anybody can say Jesus is Lord. You know, the pagan off the street can utter the words. So obviously what Paul is saying is there's something more to it than just simply saying the words. It has to reflect the heart, and that requires the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And so, when this confession is made to the glory of God the Father, the, at verse 11, a day is coming. When every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Now a couple things to realize about that. First of all, once again, I'm thankful that amongst Reformed Baptists especially, we are not canonically challenged. Canonically challenged, what does that mean? Amongst a lot of evangelicals, they have a functional 27 book canon of the Bible. The Old Testament's primarily a storybook. It's, it's how you entertain the kids during Sunday school, isn't it? We don't study it. We don't read it the way we should. But for those who knew the Old Testament scriptures, as soon as Paul starts saying, every knee will bow, any good Jewish person who knew their scriptures knows that language. That's Isaiah 48. That's Isaiah 48. And that's something the Jews held on to that Yahweh's promise was, to me every knee will bow, to me every tongue will confess. That was part of their promise. What they didn't realize is that that confession, that bowing, would be to the demonstration of who Yahweh is in the Messiah himself, in the incarnation. And the irony is they end up rejecting that. Now, today... God's kingdom continues to spread across the earth in that you and I, we bow the knee gladly. Willingly. Daily. With passion. Isn't that what it means to be a servant of Christ? We call ourselves servants of Christ. What does that mean? Any servant bowed before his master. And we have no problem doing that at all. But someday, even those who in this life
stubbornly refuse in the face of the truth to do so, that knee will bow. Today is the day of salvation. That day will not be. It will be the day of justification. It will be the day of the demonstration of God's righteousness and who Christ was, but only today when we bow the knee do we receive salvation for it. I think of a man you all may have heard of over here, a man by the name of Christopher Hitchens. Have you seen, you know, do you know who Christopher Hitchens is? The atheist. He's from England. He lives in the United States. I was supposed to debate him in August of this past year, but only a few weeks before, uh, about, actually about uh, uh, eight weeks before we were supposed to debate, he received the diagnosis of advanced esophageal cancer. Uh, the last I saw of him was stage four, and he's not looking good. And so we did not have that opportunity to, to debate. He hates God. As uh, Douglas Wilson rightly said of Christopher Hitchens, there are two things that Christopher Hitchens is absolutely certain of. God does not exist, and he hates him. <laughs> it's true. Those are the two things that uh, Christopher Hitchens is absolutely certain of. God does not exist, and he hates him. And as you listen to and he's a, he's a brilliant man, you, you cannot help but in listening to him have, uh, your, your heart goes out to the man. Even in his detestation of God, you, you, if, if, you, if you're an heir of grace, you cannot help but realize, but for the grace of God, there might I go as well. And as, you, as, I, as I ponder this text, and I listen to Hitchens, and I, yes, he has spoken to many inconsistent Christians, and he's been given a lot of bad argumentation, but he's met people who've spoken the truth to him with great clarity. And he can even tell the difference between the different kinds of Christians he's encountered. And, and I've been told that, that very often, even, even when he was going around with uh, Doug Wilson, and they were making this film about the debates they were doing, at night when the Christians would gather down in the, in the lobby of the, of the hotel, Hitchens would gather with them. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't find his atheist friends to be much of a, of, a, of a nice place to go, shall we say. He was attracted to them, and yet he remains intractable in his hatred of God, and specifically of Christ. What will be his experience in this day when every knee will bow? <coughs> He will confess someday. But you see, there's a massive difference between a confession that flows from a changed heart and one of a subdued heart. Have you thought about that? Think of that, think of that prophetic word in Ezekiel. I think it's one of the most beautiful illustrations of regeneration. Taking, I will take out a heart of stone and I will give a heart of flesh. You see, both hearts can cause the knee to bow, but only one can do it out of love. And that is why I think of the catechism question this morning. In hell eternally. We don't like that. Many people object to that. How can someone who committed a finite number of sins be punished infinitely? Have you ever heard that objection? I certainly have. In fact, uh, about a year and a half ago, Justin Brierley in uh, London, had me on his program via what's called an ISDN line. I was actually at a radio station in uh, Phoenix because he wanted to have a program, a debate on hell. And he couldn't find anybody to do it. And I said, well, I'll do it. I don't, I'm not looking forward to it, but I'll, I'll do it. I'll defend what the Word of God has to say. And in thinking about it, one of the things that crossed my mind was so often, even myself, as I've thought about that very question, how can God punish a finite number of sins for an infinite amount of time? The normal answer is, well, it's, it's an infinite debt that, that can never be paid because it's an, the infinite glory of God that has been sinned against. And there is truth to that. But there's also something else that when I thought of it, I, I almost laughed at myself for even having slipped into such a obvious error of thought. What makes anyone think that someone who goes into the punishment of God stops sinning? What's the greatest commandment? 
love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, if they, if they go into hell with a heart of stone, can they ever stop sinning? And in fact, I think the greatest punishment of hell, I don't think, you know, I think it's a bunch of medieval hooey that you've got demons running around with pitchforks and you've got tails and you know, stuff like this. It's a bunch of, bunch of silliness. There's, there's nothing about that in scripture. But I think the greatest punishment of hell, right now, there is a hand of restraint upon man's sin. And if there wasn't a hand of restraint upon man's sin, we couldn't walk outside that door and get anywhere. Every once in a while, God lifts his hand just a moment. And I don't know what the names would be over here. But in the United States, we talk about people like Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial murderer of, on a level of evil that is difficult to mention. I'll just simply say they found many of his victims in his freezer. Okay? That's how bad it was. And every once in a while, God will lift his hand and will go, Oh! Well, that's what fills the heart of man. And if I wasn't restraining it, that's what you'd see all around you. And we almost never thank God for that restraint because we don't see it. Since we don't see the evil he's restraining, we almost never thank him for the act of restraint. You see, folks, there's a day coming when his hand is withdrawn. And what must it be like to have a heart of stone, to be created in the image of God, but to have a heart of stone, and to cry out in hatred for God? Is that not the biblical teaching? God haters? In fact, some people suggest that that, that term in Romans 1, I think it's theostugais, might better, it, it says, haters of God might possibly be translated as hated by God. There's both possibilities there. You have to look at the grammar. But elsewhere they're called God haters. And right now God restrains the madness of man, but once the restraint is taken off in hell itself, what torture must it be to stand upon the parapets of hell screaming your hatred of God for eternity and knowing that there's nothing you can do any longer to in any way even hurt God or his creation. People say, oh, they're gonna, they're, we're going to be partying in hell. No, you're going to be alone. Alone with your hatred and your self-destruction. They don't stop sinning. That's why the punishment doesn't stop. And I am convinced that if you were to reach into the pit of hell 10,000 years into eternity, grab a smoking soul and bring it out and sit it down and say, here's your choice. Either love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and worship Him in purity or turn around and walk right back into where you are. Every single one would turn around, spit at you, and dive right back into where they were. I'm convinced of that. So every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess, will homologeo, to say the same thing. There will no longer be any disagreements about the Lordship of Christ. Every knee will confess. Every tongue will confess. Kurios, Jesus Christos. Yes, Jesus, the Messiah. He is Kurios. Unto the glory of God the Father. That same unity that we see in John 5. When Jesus says I do nothing off how to by myself. I do what I've seen the Father doing. Perfect harmony between us. Is seen here as well. In that Jesus does not become. A separate focus of worship. But when every tongue confesses that. Kurios. Jesus. Christos, Jesus is Lord, unto the glory of God the Father. There's no division. There's no diminishment of the Father's glory at the expense of the Son or vice versa or any of these things. Because you see, the, this, all this fulfillment, everything that was done, the fountainhead of this divine decree, as we see in Ephesians chapter 1, is the Father. And so it all resounds to his glory. Now, once again, brothers and sisters, I hope as you sit here 
And as you listen to these words, you are struck by the fact that you have been given the privilege in these words to peer into the very relationship of the Father and the Son in eternity past, to even know the thinking and thoughts of the Son before the Incarnation. Is that not amazing? That God would condescend to give us this type of of revelation? He would place it in our hands? How often do we treat it with such such a cavalier attitude? <clears throat> ah, well, you know, it's always there for me to look at. Because it's, it, we have such great availability of the Word of God in our day. This was one of the texts, I suppose, in the back of my mind, it was, honestly, it hadn't crossed my mind until just now, but when we went to the Chester Beatty Library the day before yesterday, and we almost got kicked out of the Chester Beatty Library the day before yesterday for trying to read all the papyri manuscripts in the original languages uh, using our iPhone lights and droid lights and so on and so forth. But we found that the last, like I said, said to you yesterday, the last one, the last papyri of P46, some of the earliest, the earliest attest- attestation of Paul's writings that we have, the last one on the right-hand side, It's on the back of the page, so you can't see it, but I can guarantee it's there. I can show you the picture. On the last page, on the back, are these very words. Aren't you thankful God's preserved them for us? Oh, think of the hatred that has been expressed against the Word of God for 270 years. The might of the Roman Empire tried to wipe these words out. Failed failed. Couldn't do it. How thankful we should be to have the opportunity to read these words, to possess these words, and in our day, bow the knee and confess with the tongue unto salvation. For a day is coming when that bowing of the knee and that confession of the tongue will be universal. But when it is the bowing of the knee of one whose heart has been changed, the result is justification, eternal life, union with Christ. When it is the bowing of the knee of the heart that remains hardened, it is the picture of the defeated foe who kneels before the victor and confesses his or her own defeat. That's a different picture. Now, all of it is to the glory of God the Father. Justice will be done. I don't know about you, but there are many times in this world we see injustice. We think, I, I have on my, on my lapel here, a crown of thorns. I don't wear that as artwork. I wear that as a reminder of the persecuted church. We are commanded in Hebrews 13.3 to consider ourselves to be bound together with them as if we were in the same chains they are in. And we have brothers and sisters this day who languish in prison. And they possess the key. I think in my my jacket I have the key to my bed and breakfast door. It's one of those skeleton keys things, you know. They possess the key that would open the door of their cell if they would but deny Christ. If they would just say, Jesus isn't Lord. They would be freed, but they don't use it. They don't use that key because they remain faithful. They may not see justice in this life, but the throne of Yahweh is justice, and justice will be done. And the older I get, the more important that is to me. Because you start, you start collecting a lot of injustices that you've seen over the course of your life, And if there isn't a purpose in all this, if there isn't a day when it is all going to be made right, you just sort of wonder why God did it this way. But his promise is, justice will be done. And even in the punishment of the wicked, God is glorified. Because when you think about it, that's that's the flip side of the glory he receives from the cross. The depth to which the triune God went to bring about redemption shows 
the depths of his holiness and the necessity of redemption. That's something we must keep in mind. So I hope as you look at this text, as you look at this sermon illustration, that you plumb its depths, that you see it for the precious thing that it is, I would highly recommend its memorization to you. But always remember, it's a sermon illustration. And what it's calling us to is humility of mind, service to our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And so if we want to have the attitude he had, then we have to realize while we have rights, we have to lay them aside in the service of others. Let's pray together. Indeed, our holy triune God, We approach you this day and we confess that in and of ourselves we would never approach one as holy as you. We know our hearts, we know our minds, we know our our sins, our failures. If you yourself had not opened the way, if you had not provided perfect redemption and forgiveness, our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, we would have no means of approaching you. We would flee from the light. We would flee from your holiness. But your word bids us to come. and It does so by telling us that we do not come in our own righteousness. We do not come as we are. We come clothed in the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We cannot purchase it but we can thank you for it for all of eternity. And even our thanks here upon this earth is incomplete. It's it's bereft of its fullness because we're ignorant. We don't understand. We don't even even know our own hearts well enough to know the glorious work you've done in its fullness. But someday, in purity, the saints in light will surround your throne. And we will experience perfect unity with you, not hindered by the sinfulness of this life. And we look forward to that time. But till then, by your spirit, you gather us together in your church. You give us a longing for your word. So Lord, as we seek to honor you, wherever you've placed us, whether it be in the United States or here in Ireland or in the United Kingdom and in London, In Germany, wherever your saints are, Lord, we would pray that as we seek to worship you, it would indeed have just a little bit of that glory of heaven itself. That you would continue to keep us steadfast, give us a hunger for your word, and as we leave this place, may we not be as people who have looked into a mirror and quickly forget what kind of person we've seen. But may your word be written upon our hearts and have a transforming effect. We pray in Christ's name.